All right. Um, let me welcome Aris and Sahil from um, from Credit Karma. They're going to tell us about um, how they develop their data flow pipelines with Scala and Zio. And uh, so, please take it away. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, traveling here from the Bay Area. My name is Ari. I'm an ML engineer at Intuit Credit Karma. And we'd like to present to you today about how to make all your applications, both from the inside and the outside of Beam, uh, unbreakable and supercharged by using Scala with Zio. Uh, we just want to show you how to do a lot more with less, meaning less code, less effort, uh, and fewer mistakes. So I'll give it to Sahil. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sahil Khandwala. Uh, I'm an engineer working in the offline recommendations platform team at Credit Karma. We had to share some common problems we faced while running uh, batch uh, Beam jobs. And I'm pretty sure uh, many engineers in the audience have also faced them in some fashion or the other. Uh, we're here to solve real practical problems with little effort. So who's on board? Let's get the train started. Uh, just a little bit of introduction. Uh, we at Credit Karma and are part of Intuit are working to solve real problems to help our members um, uh, you know, achieve financial progress wherever they are in the financial journey. Um, recommendations is one of the pillars at Credit Karma. Uh, it's, um, and at the core is the offline recommendations platform team. We are building a system for selecting uh, the right users, um, picking the appropriate personalized content for them, and then uh, prioritizing when do we send them probably in the day or the best time in the week. Um, ours is a small, nimble team, but we drive significant uh, revenue, both uh, uh, you know, direct and indirect revenue. And everything we do is powered by metrics, machine learning models, and experiments. The platform has services uh, driven by batch data flow jobs and just one or two streaming uh, data flow pipelines. And in the process, we uh, do offline scoring across multiple ML models. Uh, this performing almost like a billion uh, plus ML model inferences in a week uh, in a distributed fashion. Uh, a technology stack is mainly we use uh, Scala as a programming language. Uh, we use uh, we run um, a Beam jobs on Dataflow. Uh, we heavily leverage uh, the GCP platform, so use BigQuery, Bigtable, um, Cloud Scheduler, amongst many other things. Uh, just uh, you know, whenever whenever we start uh, with any big platform or system, we start small. It runs nicely, runs cute, and then suddenly it has massive adoption. Uh, similar in our case, we started with like 20 campaigns, few million users, and now we are up to like thousands of campaigns, more than 120 million users, um, and it just exploded. So the product us kept coming in, engineering us became secondary and tech debt kept increasing. Similar problems, yeah, probably many of you have already faced it. Um, the, well, the brunt, who bears the brunt? On-call engineers, because the operational load increases. Uh, we were literally woken up at 3 a.m. debugging, fixing the pipelines, um, so that we meet our SLAs. Uh, downstream systems also get affected if we um, do not mess our SLAs and eventually affects our revenue. So, on a high level, what's our goal? Our goal was to build uh, more system resiliency, uh, have better system reliability, uh, to account for both the current and future scale in mind. And we didn't really want to go in for big bang architectural changes. So um, starting off, we started a world with Scala. It's strongly typed, uh, functional, object oriented programming language, all good. And then we also work with CO, which is the um, Beam library by uh, Spotify, uh, which allows you to kind of write, uh, write uh, data flow applications and use many of the other uh, Google platform services. All this was working fine, but then we introduced to uh, introduce Zio. It's a library for type safe, concurrent, and asynchronous programming. When I say all this, what does it actually bring us? It brings us better correctness, you write code correctly the first time when you ship it. Faster development. If you can do more with less, that means you can have powerful constructs which you can use and write less code to achieve the same thing. And cheaper. Cheaper maintenance means cheaper to test, cheaper to modify code, 
With Zio, you can move code around more like Lego blocks without having to face any of the scary problems of shared state, concurrency, uh, concurrency problem blocking, thread blocking problems, et cetera. So fundamentally, going back to the title of our presentation, Unbreakable, to expand on that, it means having better failure handling. And supercharged means high performance parallelism and scheduling. I just want to remind you, we use Dataflow uh, as a runner, but you can use this with any other runner, um, like Spark, Flink, anything else. I want to bring in Ari for deep diving into some of the use cases. Great. So if you've written real production code, you have real production problems. That means things will eventually require you know, concurrency in order to get more performance. It will also mean that something nasty will happen to you, and it will happen on some stupid small piece of code you don't think will break, and it will destroy everything. So no one likes this, and the goal of, of what we, basically the outcome of what we did with Zeo was realize that all these problems are now easy and fun to handle. Uh, what you'll see here is some examples of Zeo code, and you'll see that this is very declarative, meaning you don't tell it how to do the thing you want, you just say what you want. Uh, this means that you get these properties of getting all these really good behaviors with a lot less code, a lot less effort. And you also notice that when you need these different capabilities, you can just compose them, add them on, you can decompose them, remove them. And the nice thing is it's just kind of between the Scala language and the Zeo library itself, it uh, really helps prevent all types of like extremely common problems that you would have, just writing any application, including something as uh, complicated as Beam. So just to give you an idea here, uh, more people have seen, for example, Python than Scala and the Spotify Skio Shio library. So I want to show off here just a basic idea of here's what word count looks like, right? If you've seen the Python API and so forth, this should look OK. Or if you've even looked at the, the Java API, this should seem hopefully even simpler. It's just a simple idea of uh, before using Zio, this is what it looks like, right? Read some text. Uh, with, you're going to tokenize, remove empty strings, count turn it into a, a, you know, put a little uh, colon between there and write it out. And usually what you call a pipeline, we call it a, a, a skew result. You'll see run it, wait until finish. This is what the, the normal vanilla Scala code looks like before Zio. So obviously I'm not a liar and I won't tell you that things come for free. You do have to do something to use Zio. This is what it looks like. So you'll see that, okay, this is after. You'll notice that we put these Zio.attempts there. You'll notice that we have it in this, this construct called the for comprehension. And look at the return type, def word count beam zero is a task. So there are a few mechanical changes, but even if you know nothing else about zero, this does what you think it does. It does what it did previously, plus more. And why is that called zero attempt? It's because, well, you're actually attempting something frequently. Uh, you are hoping that you will submit a data flow job. You are hoping that you'll make a, a GCS call for a small file, a BigQuery uh, client call, whatever. That's what that means. And task means it's uh, basically saying it's something that could break with, a, with a, J a JVM exception. Now, again, we said errors. All these types of errors that we have listed here are things that Zio handles directly, composably, easily, and nicely. Um, it turns out, for example, in our case, that because we were like oftentimes uh, stuck in a little bit of dependency hell, uh, we weren't able to like upgrade our libraries. And one of our biggest problems was actually uh, GCP and Dataflow bugs because we were stuck on old libraries and, and we couldn't fix them. And these were things that you could only retry the, the Dataflow job. Zio, for example, prevented us from waking up at 3 a.m. many times just alone, just for that problem there. But all these other problems are handled directly by Zio as well. So let's just talk about, like, what does it feel like to write some code with Zio? So remember the word count beam Zio job? OK, this is, this is how you call it normally. That's fine. Um, now, if I told you you need to retry this job, just think for a second. OK, you might try catch it. You might finally it. You might put it in a while loop, vars, things like that. Uh, no. All you have to do is say retry. And you say, I'm going to recur once. OK, you notice that this is very declarative. This is just saying what I want, not how. It's going to do it for you somehow. That means that as you start modifying your code, you're like, well, I actually want to retry it three times. So try it once. And if it fails, up to three times. OK. Now, you notice that there is no pausing here yet, so let's, let's make the pause happen. Now, think about how you would add a pause. Would you thread.sleep or something like that? Well, here, Zio just lets you say in this, its own little language, say, I want to retry three times. And between each retry, let's wait one minute or whatever amount of time. The cool thing about this as well is no threads are ever blocked, by the way. 
that does matter because you will eventually get to the point where you have like hundreds of things running, and if you start you know thread sleeping, you will blow up your your server. So good to know there. Now. Let's start doing more complicated things. So far, you could have just been like one little, little while loop would have worked for me. But what if I said, hey, I want to actually do like this linear increase policy. So schedule.linear says, uh, first, I'm going to try, like, let's say, a base of two seconds. And it's going to multiply each time. So two seconds, four seconds, six seconds. All right, we're getting more complicated, but not so hard. A little bit of state between uh, uh, retries. Well, OK, program this thing. What we're going to do is let's imagine just for retrying, I actually want to have this schedule where I'm going to retry with a linear increase at first. And if all that fails, I'm going to increase with, I'm going to actually retry with Fibonacci space in between. And all those spaces, by the way, they're all going to be randomly jittered because you, know, you might have multiple processes all running. If they all retry at the same time, you consume all your resources, so you want random jitter. Um, so you can read the comments there if you want. But the bottom line is, you probably wouldn't program this yourself. You can get arbitrarily complicated, right? You, you could do it, but you probably just wouldn't do it because it's easy to mess this up. It's easy to make a mistake. Why would you test just your retries? The nice thing with Zio is, even this alone, everything is built in, and many more features are built in. So you're able just to, when you have a need, you can express it easily and simply, and it will work. The thing is, the space of mistakes to make are very small because it's very clear and declarative. And here's the important part. We've talked about right now like actual whole big, let's say, batch data flow or beam jobs, right? The important thing is you have a unified language to do anything, like big data or small data. Let's say you need to grab a GCS file. You need to grab this uh, a few records out of uh, BigQuery because you need to compute something from them and put it in the beam graph before you write the beam graph. All those things can and will break and break your production system. So. This is not, uh, let's say this is not a Beam job. Let's say this is just talking to BigQuery or GCS, whatever you like, Bigtable. Um, the cool thing is, is remember, this is the type of thing that, sound, that will break eventually. Again, you can just say, I want to retry. In this case, I want to retry twice, and I have an exponential back off. OK, cool. But the nice thing is, is imagine if it actually breaks despite the retries. That's possible, right? That could totally break. You have an or else, meaning if everything else breaks, uh, at last ditch, I'm actually going to have a default feature that I'm going to return. This means that this just simply cannot fail ever. You will always have something to fall back on if that's what you want. And remember I said composable, decomposable. Well, the next one, I simply have the same code, but I just I say I don't want any retry. If anything bad ever happens, just give me the default features. Life is good. You know, Maybe we can do some logging. Let's think about something more complex. Again, this might be grabbing something over the network, computing something locally. But imagine there's a whole class of different errors, like bad things that can happen. Well, OK. The nice thing is you can just look at this here and kind of guess what's happening. You simply say, I want to catch some class of errors. And then you see on the left, I'm pattern matching on the type of exception. And on the right, I do something, whatever something is. Imagine, like based, uh, and, and then the top two examples there, I'm not even retrying. I'm simply saying, uh, give me this type of default, or give me the other kind of default, just directly back to memory. Separately, on the last two spaces there, you see uh, I might have some more complicated uh, retry mechanism, because I really want to try again. And on the bottom, I have a catch-all saying, I've never seen this before. Just retry once. And I'd like to give it back to Sahil. Thank you. So. Um... What happens if a job goes into bad state for many reasons? So like you have a batch data flow job that normally runs for 30 minutes, and on a given fine day, it's running for one hour, two hours, and still running. Could be due to bad inputs. Um, could be due to a slow ML model which just got deployed. Um, but in any case, how do we recover? You know, sometimes it's better to fail a lot on call, look into it, versus just letting it run and just letting it consume resources. So Zio provides a timeout construct. Here we can have, say, um, a new unknown model, and then we can say timeout. Timeout for one hour, two hours, even you can set it to like 30 minutes, which is great. And then once it times out, um, you can return back with some default uh, model scores, probably pre-computed or computed from yesterday. So your job doesn't fail, your downstream service is not affected, and you can go back and look in, uh, you know, check more as to why the job was taking longer. Another thing is, especially when we do personalization and we use BigQuery as a data lake, we get a lot of features from uh, BigQuery. And, um, 
Running BigQuery jobs uh, usually takes uh, seconds, but sometimes due to unavailability of slots or many users, it can take uh, a few minutes. And we want to have a timeout. We just cannot you know, have a 10-minute query running for uh, every user or so. In that case, it works brilliantly. Again, we have a kind of a default block where we can return back some pre-computed features. Um, just want to point out that BigQuery client does have like a low-level retry mechanism, but uh, which is a little bit clunky. But this is more at a higher level and works brilliant. Uh, another thing is um, there's something called a strangler. So like in a P collection or S collection, if you're using the uh, Shio library, uh, you can have uh, a few users, like out of a million, always, you know, uh, taking longer to finish, probably because the inputs are badly formatted or some other reason. Um, you can actually uh, fail even those individual users, uh, which are actually blocking your job from completing. Uh, so uh, that's also great. Coming back to um, some performance testing. Um, it's always a hit or miss or trial and error. Um, when we deploy uh, our data flow jobs, we don't know exactly how many workers should we assign on startup or like what kind of machines should we use, N1, N2, or any other uh, machine types. We just don't know. Um, even for the ML models, we need to tune the hyperparameters. So we need to run our data flow jobs and you know, uh, do some testing. And this is like a very common problem uh, faced uh, before we put a job into production. Guess what? Uh, Zero provides a race construct. What this does is you can race multiple beam jobs, and uh, what uh, and the result which you get is from the first job which finishes, and the other jobs are interrupted and killed, um, and the resources also freed up and cleaned up automatically. How cool is that? So example from here is, say you are um, reading data from a couple of different zones, A, B, C. And then once you've read the data, you're kind of uh, spinning up another uh, data flow job. And you are loading in different LLM models, for example. And you, know, you want to race against ChatGPT, BARD, or any of the open source like Alpaca, et cetera, just to give you a broad, broad idea. But, you know, uh, and you get the predictions back. Easy and sweet uh, without having to write too much of code and worrying about uh, threat safety, et cetera. Um, one other thing is um, we always have to worry about, um, apart from alerting, we have to worry about bookkeeping and also logging. Um, we need to know how long our data flow jobs are taking. Um, and we have a very uh, easy way to do that by using the time construct. It not only runs the job, but also gives the output and the duration, so how long it takes. Right here is a kind of a screenshot from a Slack channel. We have different jobs, and we are logging the duration. Uh, we can log in Slack, Log Explorer, or Splunk, or any other um, uh, logging framework, and you know build out some nice dashboards from it. So it's really helpful and really neat. Um, that's it for me. Uh, bring in Ari back to talk about uh, how it's important of dividing work and scheduling. And he has a very nice story with a good use case. Cool. So the last thing we'd like to share with you is the story of the evolution of our scale for a very large uh, ML inference project that we have running in production right now. And so we had to go from, from big data to very big data. We started off on the order of magnitude around uh, 100 million uh, model inferences up to about a uh, hundred billion, uh, and these had to be finished within one week. And so the, the cool thing about this is we were able to, as needs changed and resources uh, were, were needs for resources were changed, we were able to very easily, safely modify a little bit of code and get a lot of value out of it. So ultimately, you can just imagine in a simplified world, imagine just having some number of models times some no number of user features, just for, simple, for simplicity here. Uh, and this is, let's say, the high level piece of simple piece of work, a pure function that we want to evaluate, right? Um, this started off being around you know, 100 million and it scaled up to eventually 100 billion. And of course, these were chunked off into different data flow batch jobs. So, what we're going to see here is that there's the fundamental work that needs to be done. That gets chopped up into batches of work. And then suddenly, all those batches of work become a meta problem that we have to worry about. But we're able to solve it nicely. So 
In the simple world, imagine you have some smallish number of data flow jobs and well, whatever amount you have, and you have a week to get it done. That's fine. You do it in sequence. Nice, simple. But where does this go? Bam. Eventually, you run out of time. Simple as that. The code to do this is very simple. This one line at the bottom, we're simply saying, in order to do this sequentially in Zio, we say, Zio for each, you take this list of batch inputs, OK, that's the input to the, bat, to, the, uh, to the beam job, and then process models beam job. So it's just a for each, and then we're going through that list and running n number of jobs. OK, that's fine. Uh, but we knew that that has a limit, right? What we really want to do after sequentiality is saying, well, we actually want to run those batch data flow jobs in parallel, a bunch at the same time. OK, that's a nice evolution. That's fine. Now, uh, where does this go? Well, yeah. It, Basically, it goes bam. Eventually, you're going to have way too many jobs. You're going to run out of resources. You're, you know, you're going to run out of electricity in the planet, right? You're just not going to be able to run everything. So OK, uh, fine. This works well for a while. Now let's look at it from the Clang code. Like, What code did we have to write to do that? Uh, notice that for each. you just have to write zero for each par. Now, that's fantastic. Uh, just keep in mind like what you would have to do in your any programming language, really, or any framework, just to start getting this parallelism at the cost of typing in PAR. It's typically not that easy, right? Especially with everything being handled for you properly. This doesn't break. Now, what we really want is we want both. We want sequentiality plus parallelism, right? We want to say, don't give me 100 parallel jobs. Give me like, I don't know, five parallel jobs, and then five, 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 you know, so we finish. OK, that's fine. Where is this going to go? Well, yeah, this actually helps a lot. But even then, we hit some SLA problems. And we'll hit that last problem in just a second. But what does, what does a happy path look like in Zio? OK, you take this for each par thing, and then you say, with parallelism, five. That's all you got to do. And whether you're talking about, you know, again, big query queries or whole beam jobs, it's the same code. It's one language. It's all unified. Now, we said we had one final hairy problem. And let, let's, let's dive into those sets of five you know, mini batches. So the problem with our use case is that scheduling the jobs alone was also kind of hard because you know, data flow jobs, depending on your, let's say, the models alone, they could take any, any time they want. So in reality, they were taking somewhere between, let's say, two hours and 12 hours. right? And the problem with naive parallelism is you wait for the final slowest job before you get a whole new batch. That's not good. Because you see that red area there? That's all dead time. That's work starvation. It's sort of like thread starvation. You got work starvation. This is time you could have been working that you just weren't working, and then eventually it mattered. Eventually, you blew up your SLA. Um, so you have like this green line, which is like this artificial boundary that we don't want that artificial boundary, right? We want what, what we really want is we want a, a picture like this, a constant stream of batch jobs just continuously flowing through. No more artificial fake thing. We just have all five lanes of traffic always filled with work until everything is done. Think about how hard that is. Think about the amount of work, you know, labor, effort, and testing you have to do. Well, in Zio, all we had to do was change this code into something from Zio Streams code. So I'm sorry. Yes, it is a little bit harder. It's four lines of code now. But all we had to say was, let's talk for Zio Streams. Let's get that list of jobs. We're going to flat map five at a time. And we're going to process the models there. And you see that dot .ignore? I could have said retry. I could have said whatever. But ignore means, hey, if anything still breaks, just, just keep going. You know, Rambo, keep going. And run that. So. This is real production code. This means that we always have five lanes of jobs always running, for example. And then, hey, we were able to really crank out a huge amount of performance from all the resources and budget that we had. So Zio really helped us out. Zio is a wonderful thing. I think it's a great toolkit for you to think about you know, as a model of thinking about the world in terms of both, I guess, asynchronous, parallel, and, and resilient programming. Uh, it's really helped us out a lot. And with that, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.